Good evening, I'm Tony Jones and tonight we're presenting a new Australian documentary that takes a different look at the climate change debate. I Can Change Your Mind About Climate. It brings together climate change activist Anna Rose and sceptic Nick Minchin to look behind the science and examine why the debate has become so vitriolic and unproductive. We've gathered together an audience of 250 at a panel representing a range of views to continue the discussion after the documentary. So is there a way forward? Are you open to different ways of thinking about this divisive issue? We'll be using Quanda Vote to ask about your views and you can join us now to watch I Can Change Your Mind About Climate. And stay with us afterwards for our Q&A special. Already into the dangerous level of carbon dioxide, and it's going to increase more. All of Australia is warm uh, in every state over every season. The Earth's climate is constantly changing, driven by a multitude of natural forces. To be manageable, now threaten to spin out of but now, a new force is disrupting the climate system. Arctic, uh, sea ice melting, glaciers receding. Humans are driving dangerous global warming. Human activity has adversely affected our climate. Or at least, that's what the world scientists are telling us. What do we want? But back down on Earth, about half of all Australians don't believe climate change is man-made. Carbon dioxide does not drive temperature. While the other half believe the need for action is urgent. We are the last line of defence for Mother Nature. One of the things which I think has disconcerted a lot of people is the evangelical fervour uh, of the climate change alarmists. Climate change is real. Planet, planet. Is there a better way to resolve the conflict that's dividing our nation? We're taking environmental activist Anna Rose. We've come together to release this statement calling for greater action on climate change. And we're calling for deep emission reduction targets. And committed climate skeptic Nick Minchin. One day the world will realize that carbon dioxide is more of a friend than an enemy. Around the globe, to meet their pick of the world's leading voices on climate change. Has, ever in history has the CO2 levels been as high as they are now? Not in the last million years. 111 countries. Gallup did a survey. The majority of the human race isn't afraid of global warming. I'm not going to be engaging in point to point debate because he is known for making things up. There's a lot at stake. One thing that really pisses people like me off is this red herring that people like you raise and it is part of the slander of the environmental movement. They'll be trying to change each other's mind on the most important questions of our time. Is climate change happening? There's no empirical evidence that we are driving dangerous global warming, no. Are humans to blame? Well, this is very like... clearly caused by humans. And is it dangerous enough to change everything? We're being asked to take a huge gamble so because they want to change the whole industrial system. People like her have to acknowledge the reality that there are people who disagree with them. And just to ignore that or not engage with them, it's, it's ostrich behaviour. If Nick Minchin changed his mind on climate change and he did accept the science, it would be amazing. In his hometown of Adelaide, recently retired Liberal Party power broker Nick Minchin is an agreeable company. No, that's probably global warming as well. The wonderful thing about global warming is you can blame it for everything. <laughs> no one here is alarmed at the prospect of a global climate catastrophe ending our civilization anytime soon. You're all attending um, the inaugural meeting of FOCD, the Friends of Carbon Dioxide, and I want to thank you all for coming along. Climate change was not, you know, the, the preeminent issue for me until I became the Minister for Science in 98. Uh, and I suppose I'm naturally a, a sceptic about assertions that are made um, by um, particularly left-wing groups, and this issue was being pushed hardest by left-wing groups. 
I could see that the implications of it were quite serious for industry and the resources sector. Those of us who are supporters of carbon dioxide are certainly the underdogs in the, in the battle ahead. Um, can I introduce the film crew? Um, you may have noticed there's a camera pointing at us um, to make a documentary on climate change. And they have two protagonists, uh, me, the, um, uh, the token sceptic, and a true believer in a young woman called Anna Rose. Based on the pollution we've already emitted and the amount of coal, oil and gas that the world wants to burn, we may have already locked in global average temperature rises of maybe three, maybe four, maybe even five degrees. And the question is now, what are we prepared to do about it? An environmental activist since her teens, Anna Rose co-founded the Australian Youth Climate Coalition while still in her early 20s. The elephant in the room is... The AYCC has grown to over 70,000 members, all sharing Anna's vision of weaning Australia off fossil fuels. Stop. Enough is enough. Climate change is not an issue about politics or polar bears. It's about the survival of our generation and of those to come. Do we as a society believe that our young people are worth enough to protect our future and the young people that are still yet to be born? Are we factoring them into the decisions that we're making today? Because that's what it's about. It's a moral issue. Nick and Anna are divided by their age, their attitudes and their politics. But they've both agreed to take part in a journey that will challenge their deeply held views. Australia's greatest, single most important competitive advantage has been access to cheap, reliable energy produced by coal. You don't jeopardise that unless there is absolutely overwhelming evidence that you must do that to save, you know, the Australian nation. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Maury. Thank you. Lovely to be here. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. Have you been to Maury before? I think it's really important to understand people who still don't accept the science, to understand what it will take to change their, their mind if they are open to change. And we need to be talking to them. We can't just ignore them. For the next four weeks, Nick and Anna will be travelling the world together, yeah, and the rules of the challenge are simple. They'll get to take their opponent to meet their pick of the world's leading voices from each side of the climate debate. So here we are, Tiralva. Anna goes first, and she's taking Nick to a place close to her heart, her uncle's farm. We used to come up here pretty much every holiday, non-stop, yeah. so it means a lot to me. That's why I care about climate change, because I got to learn yeah, as a kid that everything was connected. Yep. Well, this climate's perfect. I'm happy for it to stay like this, you know? Well, today's pretty nice. <laughs> perfect for Nick, maybe. But some Australian farmers have already seen their land begin to warm. Anna's uncle, Jeff Vickers, has first-hand experience of a changing climate. I've been here about uh, about 26 years, and uh, over the years I've sort of noticed a few changes that have happened. Uh, we've just, um, in the last couple of years, seen buffalo fly on a place that have never been seen here before. They're fairly compressed. Yeah, 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 another thing that I've noticed is that we're able to sow our summer crops earlier. With our summer crop, we do measure the temperature of the soil ourselves, and specifically at sort of 9 o'clock in the morning, mm. at the depth that we sow the seed. and. What we have noticed is that over the years, we've been able to sow our summer crops prob probably three weeks to a month earlier than we used to. We know that some things are, are very easily measured, like the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, yeah. we can measure that. And all the predictions are saying that it's going to rise dramatically. Plant food, mate. Sorry? Plant food. Without CO2, <laughs> yeah. there ain't no plants. <laughs> I well, love it. That's right, but, yeah. but certainly too much, too much carbon dioxide, you've got no plants. And, it's not a joking matter to me. Nobody disagrees, A, the climate changes, B, that there's, we're going through a warming phase. It's a question of what is driving that and is there anything we can actually do about it? And I guess that's, that's the debate. Everyone agrees that the climate is warming, even skeptics like Nick. But he doesn't accept that we are to blame. 
He's taking Anna to WA to meet a husband and wife team, convinced that the climate science just doesn't add up. I was keen for us to come to Perth because I'd like to meet Joe Nova and David Evans. They interest me because they used to accept the, what I call the orthodoxy on anthropogenic global warming, but the more they've studied it, the more skeptical they've become. Have From the seen... point of view of someone like me, you know, um, seeking to uh, see if it's possible for you to <laughs> travel the same path. But even the quiet Perth suburbs are not immune to the suspicion that infects the climate debate. Okay. I'd really like to be able to do this documentary without this kind of loopy, paranoid stuff going on. And yeah, is there anything that you can do to stop them? Not really. Yeah, I'm asking you to trust them. 400 emails to check. With more than a million hits a year, Joan Nova is one of the world's most widely read skeptic bloggers. Hello there. Oh, come in, come Together in. Together with her husband, former carbon accounting modeller David Evans, they're two of Australia's most influential skeptics. But afraid of being misquoted, Joe and David have hired a camera person to film the film crew. Can I just ask, um, with the footage that you're taking, what will it be used for? And can I get a guarantee that you won't put it on your blog and selectively edit? Yes, insurance. <laughs> Okay. The climate's important and we should be discussing the evidence and what goes on with it. We really just want to make sure that, that I guess we're not taken out of context and that our arguments are put in their full picture. Hi, I don't believe we've actually met, but oh, if you're going to be filming us. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Rose Barry. I guess you know everyone else. Anna, we agree that carbon dioxide causes global warming. Every molecule of carbon dioxide that we emit causes some global warming. It's not a question of if it closes warming or not, it's a question of how much. So we're just arguing, we're, we all agree that climate change is happening, it's due to yes. carbon pollution, but we're no, just saying no. about how no, much... No, I agree that climate change is occurring, <laughs> but I don't think it's due to carbon, uh, carbon dioxide well, some emissions. Some small, immeasurable amount Some very small amount is, due to but the majority is not. The reason that climate scientists blame carbon dioxide is because of the models. But the models are fundamentally flawed. We know that because we've now over the last 15 years, collected several data sets in several different areas that contradict the models entirely. Anna, most of the heat in the climate is contained in the oceans, a relatively small amount in the air, right? However, we've only measured ocean heat properly since 2003 when the Argo system went in. And these are the entire Argo results. And they show pretty much that the temperature of the oceans has been flat, whereas the climate models are all insisting that the temperature of the ocean ought to be rising. So you're saying the ocean is not warming? No, the, data the Argo says... system says that the ocean is not warming. And a second bit of evidence that shows the climate models are fundamentally flawed. Half the world's thermometers, official thermometers for measuring global warming, are at airports. This one's at Rome Airport. So you've got aircraft taxing in here. They occasionally hit this thermometer here with blasted jet air. There's a bunch of cars and trucks over here. This isn't measuring global warming, it's measuring local warming, a very local warming. It's measuring the increase in air traffic. I mean, how stupid do you think climate scientists are to not... They do account for this. Well, they have a failed theory on their hands. That... Well, they, they, they try to and build... concealing. Mm. So, scientists are concealing... It, I've just showed you evidence that each on its own, independently, shows that the climate models are wrong. They disagree with reality quite violently. You're asking for the world to take a huge gamble and choose not to act on the very small chance that you might be right. And if well, you look at it the other way, Anna, that we're being asked to take a huge gamble that those who assert that our emissions are warming the planet dangerously are right. So because these... they want to change the whole industrial system. But if we take that gamble and, and don't act, the consequences are that we destroy the entire planet. Or well, we could... No. Actually, I don't think it's funny. Planet is not to... going to be destroyed. Anna, there's no evidence for it. But they right. haven't got a clue what's going on about carbon dioxide. What's the problem? That wasn't easy. But like it or not, Anna and Nick will be stuck together for the next few weeks. Cheers. And they're going to have to work hard to keep it civil. Thank you, Anna, for coming to see Joe and David today. And I appreciate you be, being willing to come and meet them. And I know, you know, you disagree with a lot of the things they're saying. But... Mm, the real issue, I think, is, as you say, they're saying one thing and they wholeheartedly believe it. But I think in, in the end it comes down to what's the responsible people to trust. Is it 
Joe and David and the people that they're citing, or is it the vast majority of climate scientists? To meet some of those scientists, Anna, Nick and a film crew of four and their hundred or so kilograms of gear embark on their first international leg, heading halfway across the Pacific to Hawaii. They'll be adding nearly six tonnes of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere along the way. But does that really matter? High on top of the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, this research station is ground zero in the climate debate. This is where it all began. For more than 50 years, scientists here have measured the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's what they found that first set the alarm bells ringing. The team here today is led by observatory station chief, John Barnes. What we're doing here is watching Aiden take a flask sample. Mauna Loa is really unique because we're up so high. We're above most of the pollution, local pollution. You can see the cloud layer, and that's really the top of the boundary layer. So most of the pollution particulates and water vapor are below us. This continuous record of CO2 reveals something truly remarkable. This yearly cycle of the Earth breathing in and breathing out the biosphere taking in CO2 and then releasing it. Uh, what drives that? What causes that? Yeah. Well, in, in the summertime, your plants are growing and yeah. they're taking in carbon right. dioxide. Yeah. And just the reverse happens in winter. You get, um, they're decomposing and it comes yeah. back out. And yeah. that's been going on for millions of years. Sure. But on top of that natural annual cycle, the data shows a worrying long-term trend. The thing that was really obvious in just a few years was that the level of CO2 was increasing. <clears throat> right now, it's about 392, and in a few years, it'll yeah, reach 400. This comes from human burning of fossil fuels? Yes, we're sure that the increase is due to fossil fuel burning. Yeah. That's the only thing that works, that makes Me sense. Too. Has ever in history has the CO2 levels been as high as they are now? Not in the last million years. That's really scary to me, this graph. Seeing... It's only 0.03 to 0.04. I'm too excited. But it's never been... <laughs> Trust me, I'm not excited. I'm actually scared. <laughs> I, I mean, the fact that it's never been at this level in a million years. And this is the consequences to our actions to burning fossil fuels. I have a little souvenir for your visit to Mauna Loa Observatory. This is the last yeah, hourly last measurement weekend. of CO2. Oh, 389.02. Yeah, and then the date has been written on there. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. That's so great. you can have this and you can say, I was there when it was below 400. Nick's not scared of rising CO2 because he doesn't believe the link to dangerous warming has been proven. To try and convince him, Anna is taking Nick to the University of Hawaii to hear visiting Australian climate scientist Matthew England explain the basics. We've got a lovely planet here. It's been relatively stable for about three or 4,000 years, but and draw a few smokestacks in here over the land. Human activity since around the uh, 18th century has been ramping up the emissions from uh, burning of coal and fossil fuels. And this increases the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so, of course, when the sun's energy heats the Earth's surface, more of that heat gets trapped. And you start to see warming over the Earth's surface. It's all pretty straightforward so far. But figuring out just how much warming is where it starts to get tricky. The, the very best estimates of what our planet will warm by is, is three degrees Celsius if we double the concentration. It could be as high as 4.5. It could be as low as just under two degrees C. So Depending on the assumptions you make about feedback, you're all assuming this positive feedback because it's not the CO2 itself, it's its impact on water vapour, isn't that right? This trend here Nick's right. Is, is CO2 won't lead to significant warming by itself. 
But a series of knock-on effects within the climate system known as feedbacks could. And it's this disagreement about feedbacks that's at the heart of the debate. For every degree Celsius warming you get from carbon dioxide, you can get up to another degree C from water vapour feedback. But so, I, well, so I thought that was still an area of substantial argument. Not, it's not nearly as debated as, as some right. people are trying to make out. Though some people include Nick's next advocate, As they arrive in mainland USA, Nick's planning to trump Anna with one of the most controversial figures in the climate debate. Oh, there's it. Echo Alpha A, Charlie Queen, Whiskey Ocean, One India. Okay, Atmospheric physicist Richard Lindzen swims against the tide. He says there's no cause for alarm and argues that clouds and water vapour will actually limit the warming effect of increased CO2. If you just let CO2 do its thing, it does very little. If you have negative feedbacks, which we would maintain you do have, you get even less. To get what the people who are worried have, you need to have a strong positive feedback. So strong that if you regarded the Earth as a system, no engineer would ever build it this way. And the Earth has lasted four and a half billion years. So you believe that because the Earth must have something to protect it from climate change? Oh, we change. know the things it does. I mean, every IPCC report points out clouds are an unknown. But if you were arguing that clouds would prevent the planet from warming and we've actually experienced... No, no, no. Nobody is saying prevent warming, restrict warming. But we've already had three quarters of a degree of warming. Yeah. and we should have seen three, according to the models. Something is restricting it. One of the things that I think Nick and I have to look at when we're weighing up who to trust on this debate mm -hmm. is people's past positions. And I know that you were someone who was giving testimony for the tobacco industry about I the I never impacts. did that. That is pure slander. Well, testimony may be the wrong word. I'm, I apologise. Did you dispute that there was a, not I a link between smoking and health as problems? most people who've looked at it, that the case for secondhand tobacco is not very good. Anything in science requires you look at it. I, you know, I've always found it profoundly offensive that to question something indicates you're doing something wrong. Well, he's obviously a smart person, but that doesn't mean he's smart about everything. And I was really surprised that he brought up that he doesn't believe that passive smoking causes health problems. Oh, no. because, come on. Because Gee, it clearly You raised does. that issue and it clearly there is an ongoing debate. I know that. Everybody knows there's an ongoing debate. You know, no one says it's been absolutely established beyond doubt that passive smoking kills people. But we still think that it's prudent and it's, enough it's to up, act. It's entirely irrelevant to this debate and one thing that really pisses people like me off is this red herring that people like you raise about tobacco. It's outrageous and you should stick to the debate. But Nick, I I'm think sorry to lose my temper, but I think it's wrong. I do believe it's relevant to it look at the It is utterly irrelevant to raise issues about tobacco and it is part of the slander of the environmental movement in attacking anybody who doesn't accept what they say. Nick, I do think that we have to look at the past claims of people who are Rubbish. saying that... <laughs> but how else do we judge people's credibility? Oh, based on the science they do in climate. Anna has a point. Richard Lindzen's views are in the minority amongst climate scientists. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's wrong. All right, hold on. Guys, I need to get you inside. Theories need to be tested and judged against recorded observations. And one of the main arguments of skeptics like Nick is that the very foundation of global warming, the temperatures are rising, is based on faulty data. Just outside San Francisco at the University of California, Berkeley, we have a surprise for Anna and Nick. A scientist well known for his skeptical views has gone back to check the figures. The stations that were recording these temperatures, so many of them were right next to buildings or heat sources. 
Physicist Richard Muller was so concerned that errors might have corrupted the temperature record that he set up an independent study to reconstruct the last 50 years of climate history. How about sitting here? Yeah, good idea. We looked at the effects of the extra heating that takes place in cities, which is not part of the global warming. Uh, we looked at the station quality bias. We saw this from um, some people that we visited in oh, yes. Perth. Yes. Were showing us that, saying that, you know, the main cause of global warming is, is air conditioners because they're next to. Well, I mean, what this shows is that it could be the main cause mm. of, of, yeah, of global warming. Not placing... And so, and so, these are precisely the things that we studied. We looked at. Yeah. yeah. Does it yeah. surprise you where they've put? A lot of these measuring stations, the fact that they are near all these? You know, I'll tell you, when people were building these stations 10, 20 years ago, okay. they put them where it was convenient, <laughs> where they wouldn't have to walk far in the rain to do uh, it. Right, yeah. So now we worry about it. Well, let me show you some of the results. I'm mean, quite frankly, uh, when we got this, I, I, was, I was surprised. Uh, the three blue, green, and red curves are what the previous groups had found, and the black one is what we found. And we're getting basically the same result as other people have had. Yes, it's level Muller's results have shaken the skeptic world. They confirm that the temperature records produced at NASA and in the UK were right all along. Some of the doubts raised by Perth bloggers Joe Nova and David Evans seem to have been answered. And this one-time skeptic now thinks we have much to be concerned about. This is going to make you feel very bad. OK. <laughs> These are the projections, not of global warming, mm -hmm. but of the amount of, of global warming gases that okay. are being put into the atmosphere. And here's the United States going down, down, down. This is if we follow Obama's scheme of reducing by 80%. Mm -hmm. These are the emissions of the developing world. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the major emissions are zooming up. Yeah. So globally, what kind of temperature increase would we be looking at? What's the range? If the, well, the range of this could be five degrees Celsius. It could be as small as two degrees Celsius if the theory is right. I'm hoping the theory is wrong. Mm -hmm. None of the programs being suggested have a chance of stopping this yeah. if it's real. Yeah. None of them have a, yeah. have a chance. It's a grim message. But what will Nick and Anna make of a scientist who lets the data speak for itself? I guess from the point of view of both Anna and I, a lot of what he said would have pleased Anna in terms of its verification of the temperature trend, but also from the point of view of someone like me who thinks we need to exercise great caution about this, his, uh, I thought, very interesting um, commentary on how unrealistic it is to just think we can just stop emitting CO2 and just stop whatever warming is occurring. You're not going to stop the Chinas and Indias of the world building more power stations. A big thing that Nick and I have been talking about is hope. And he sometimes almost even goes from denial to despair in the sense that he'll say, yep, I deny the science, I don't accept it. But even if I did, there's no hope of solving it. He said that a couple of times. And for me, of course, it's hard to always be hopeful because the science is getting scarier. But you have to have hope if we're going to have any chance of solving this problem. Nick and Anna have heard the same thing, but taken away very different messages. On the next leg of their journey, they are taking the train, cutting their carbon footprint by a factor of four compared to flying. It's a six-hour trip, plenty of time to reflect on the science they've seen. Has it helped either of them to change their mind? What was interesting about Lindzen um, is not to say that there is one single cause, because the, the climate is controlled by such a huge and extraordinary and complex range of factors. There are a lot of forces much more powerful than humankind involved in it. So that's why, you know, but... but um, I know that's you're not convinced of that, so I, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, Matthew said really clearly that what scientists are telling us is that, yes, in the past, other things like the sun influenced the climate, but when you look 
look at how much CO2 has risen and you look at how much temperatures have risen, I think it's very difficult for you to say that it's natural variability. I think there's nothing natural about what we've been doing to this planet. Despite that extraordinary difficulty, I managed to do it, however. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but that's not, that, that's Matthew's opinion. You know, yeah. No, it's not, it's not opinion. Science is not about opinion. opinion. It's about, well, it, it it's is about his opinion. evidence. It's not, it's not a theoretical debate. We've seen warming. It's, have real, it's had real impacts. Of course we've seen warming, but we're still... And you're still... just saying, what's it due to? It is not settled that humans are driving dangerous global warming because there is no empirical evidence of that. There's no... You don't think there's any empirical evidence? There's no evidence? empirical evidence that we are driving dangerous global warming, no. Oh, yes, that's uh, and, and, and that as someone uh, you know, in politics, that is not a sufficient basis for what is really an economic revolution that's being proposed. It's not for lack of explanation that he doesn't accept the science. Even Muller, who used to be a climate sceptic, explained it very clearly, explained the temperature increase because for him it's not actually about science, it's about, as he keeps talking about, economics um, and his political ideology. When you ask him why are you a climate sceptic, he always begins with the sentence, politically I'm a conservative. He said that a number of times and that tells me that this isn't about science for him, it's about the way that he thinks like a politician and his particular type of politics. There is a lopsidedness because Anna comes to this as, as a committed climate change activist. So she is, you know, on a mission to convince the world that we have dangerous global warming and we've got to do something about it. My position is the debate remains open. Anna's position is there's no debate. Well, you know, it's pretty hard to get in, you know. On that basis, she's not going to be listening to anybody who's, who's a contrary view. Say la vie. If science can't resolve Nick and Anna's differences, how can any of us, and most importantly our politicians, make informed decisions when it comes to climate change? We've arrived at Capitol Hill, the center of power in the US, and where the ultimate fate of climate action might be decided. Anna doesn't know it yet, but she's about to get a lesson in politics, Washington style. Well, Anna, I was keen for us to come to Washington because I'd like you to meet one of the um, more interesting climate change skeptics in the United States, a guy called Mark Morano, who worked for Senator James Inhofe, who's probably the Congress's leading climate change skeptic. I have heard of him. Uh, yeah, I imagine you would have. He's not a scientist. He's not a politician. Online journalist Mark Morano runs a popular skeptic news website, and he's the man credited with bursting the climate belief bubble in the US. Nick, I wanted to say I'm quite surprised that you brought me to meet Mark because I know in Australia people haven't heard of him, but in the US I feel like he's actually been quite discredited because he misrepresents scientists, he's been shown to just make things up, and most, most worryingly to me, he publishes scientists' email addresses on his website under pictures of Hitler and encourages his readers to then email them, and then they get death threats. So I think that I'm happy to listen to what Mark has to say today, but I'm not going to engage in point-to-point -point debate. Well, it's a very aggressive opening, Anna, uh, and I'm so Sorry if you're taking Welcome that approach, and I'll um, happy for Mark to respond to that. But I think it is instructive if you really want to um, be open-minded about where this whole debate is at. To talk to someone like Mark, who's been actively involved in this issue, um, what the US does is critical to whether you know the world is ever going to do anything about CO2 emissions. Well, you know, I'm happy to debate any legitimate climate scientist. Mark is not a climate scientist, and I feel that the tactics he uses aren't even helpful to your side of the debate. What a cop out, Anna. You say you don't want to debate. Uh, is that because you don't know if you have the science on your side? Uh, your reference to the death threats? I proudly post the publicly available emails of scientists who make absurd claims, and I just help bring the public to these scientists who can finally hear the anger, the frustration, the intellectual arguments against them. The point is not to send abuse to scientists. The point is they can hear from the public, and of course, any public figure is going to get a percentage of abuse. Where we are now in 2011 with the cold global warming debate, um, I argue that from A to Z, the man-made global warming movement has literally egg on their face. 
Uh, and I'm talking from the Arctic, which is now 9,000 Manhattans over the low point of 2007. Sea level, which contrary to predictions of it accelerating, has actually dropped, an historic drop, according to the European Space Agency and NASA. Polar bears at or near historic population high. Global temperatures that hit their high point in 1998. Claims of 2005, 2010 being the hottest years are based on hundreds of a degree Fahrenheit. It's a political yeah. statement. You can't even get a margin of error to even approach what they're claiming. 111 countries, Gallup did a survey, the majority of the human race isn't afraid of global warming. Anna, you should not be affiliated with a movement that proved itself subprime science, subprime economics, and subprime politics. You are the face of one of the greatest threats of our liberty, and that is intellectual, international bean counters trying to control average people's lives because they think they know better how people should live because if people are left to their own devices, we'll somehow destroy the planet. It is a mockery. You've been had. You need to go back and re-examine your conscience, Anna. My conscience? Conscience. <laughs> I'm pretty conscious, and I have looked at the evidence. Your intellectual conscience. Mm. No I'm getting silence. To that. No response to that. I'm getting silence no. here. I'm trying to be as, as, as personable yeah. and uh, likable as I can be. And I'm, I'm curious, you don't want to discuss anything at all? I'm really happy to listen to what Mark has to say, but as I said at the start, I'm not going to be engaging in point-to-point -point debate because he is known for making things up. <laughs> what did he make up? Do a simple Google search, you will find hundreds of examples. What did you make up, Mark? I don't know. I can't defend myself against yeah, non-attacks, is what she's doing. Yeah. Basically, she's and saying I'm a liar, so she won't talk to me. And well. Look, it's a real problem in this debate that those of us who are, you know, not prepared yet to be convinced that man is causing dangerous global warming, just get attacked personally all the time. Nick, um, how can you say that so yet have brought me to the worst of the worst Republican attack dogs? I would have thought that you, of all people, would pick a different kind of spokesperson to take me to in Washington. Well, I have enormous respect for Mark. I think he runs one of the most interesting uh, websites there is on this issue. Uh, he's done enormous work in Congress on exposing a lot of the exaggeration. No, look, I really want to thank you, Mark, for giving no up problem, your time. Yeah. Thank Terrific you, Nick. Enjoyed it. Thanks for yeah. taking yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Good on you, mate. I was just... <laughs> I was so surprised that Nick would want to associate himself with someone like Mark Moranu. I really could hardly believe it. Nick must be thinking, though, about... if the Liberal Party does get in government, what they're going to do on climate change, because it's not going to go away. And... Yeah, I wonder... I wonder what he's thinking. I was disappointed that Anna was not prepared to engage with Mark Morano, people like her, they have to acknowledge the reality that there are people who disagree with them. And just to ignore that or not engage with them, it's, it's ostrich behaviour. Eight cities and 29,000 kilometres into their journey and they've never been further apart. So the only natural forces that come into play when it's cooling, but any natural force that has anything to do with warming is, no, that doesn't happen. It's just, it's just utterly illogical. But Nick and Anna are not alone. Surveys in the US and Australia show that belief that humans are changing the climate is waning. In both countries, close to half of us are unconvinced. We have never been more divided. Perhaps we need to come at this from a different direction. Maybe it's more useful to ask not what people believe, but why. Now in New York City, Anna and Nick head online to speak with Yale social scientist Anthony Lysowitz. OK, well, great to meet you both. Um, so I've been studying American public opinion for about 10 years. So I guess let me... Lysowitz has been looking at attitudes to climate change and to see where Nick and Anna sit, he's asked them to take an online test. A matter of degree, what's your climate profile? Take this survey to find out what your answers say about you, your relationship to climate change and your lifestyle, OK? I think global warming is happening. Well, I don't know. <laughs> if global warming... His research shows that when it comes to their response to climate change, Americans fall into six distinct camps. Do I think global warming is happening? Yes. Ranging from the dismissive to the alarmed. How worried? Very. Okay. Well, how'd you guys do? It's not a test, by the way. Is well, it? I, was, I was very nervous doing it, you know. I was here, I haven't had time to study for this. Um, well, I ended up in the doubters category. 
uh, which, uh, which then said doubters tend to be, uh, what, older, white, male, and conservative in their disposition. And so. well educated. <laughs> Well, that well. doesn't look like you at all. <laughs> no, I don't think that can't be, right? <laughs> um, and I got, I was part of the alarmed category, so I, you know, think climate She's change will affect me personally, and, <laughs> and I'm worried about the impact it will have on America and on other countries in the world. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that this is really about values. So, for instance, the alarmed and the concerned, the people who are the most concerned about climate mm -hmm. change, tend to have very strong what we would call egalitarian values. They're mm -hmm. very concerned about social justice, the impact on other people, and fairness is really a core value. Uh, the doubtful and the dismissive, however, are what we call strong individualists. Um, they often have a very anti-government view, uh, believe that the government should you know, have as little interference in society as possible. Also, interestingly, there's a broader psychological phenomenon, and I'm not saying that this is what's going on for either of you, but this is something that's a human tendency is what's called confirmation bias. And yeah. we're all subject to this to some degree. And we all have this tendency to look for information that validates what we already believe. Mm. And even most subversively, to take information that does contradict what we believe and distort it and twist it and say, no, 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 that really does, you know, it, it really does. That's not either that. of us. Right. No, no. Okay, so I, I, all I'm saying is that this is a human characteristic. I, I, I'm be interested in your views on what I see as a paradox in this debate, in that yeah. those climate scientists who you know genuinely think we've got a big problem are a bit inclined to exaggeration to get the public's attention. But That's apocalyptic scenarios are actually yeah. driving people into the sort of doubtful or dismissive category. Yeah. Do you see this happening? Um, That's a great question. Fear is not a sustainable emotion. What it tends to do is that people tend to either become paralyzed. Some people will say, oh, I, I can't look. You know, I don't want to look at it anymore. And other people will just say, look, you doom and gloomers have been talking about the end of the world for, you know, 30 years. Look outside. It's still here. So, you know, stop with that. And, and I think all it does is it just keeps it away from getting us to this much more rational way of thinking about it, which is this is a risk. Yeah. And it's about managing the risk so we don't end up with our house burning down. Sure. And I think that's really the question that we need to grapple with. And unfortunately, we get stuck in the extremes. Right. So somehow we've got to, you know, get to a point where we can just have a constructive discussion. Mm. Nick seems to have taken Lizerwitz's message to heart. His final move is much more strategic, a world away from the combative Mark Murano. He's found someone he thinks Anna will listen to, the self-proclaimed sceptical environmentalist Bjorn Lomborg. Oh, we're about to meet uh, Jean Lomborg, uh, and I was really keen for you to meet him because he's got an interesting perspective. He kind of accepts that humans are causing global warming, but he has a different, he has a different view about how dangerous that warming is and what we really should be doing about it and he brings to bear a sort of a cost-benefit analysis of the issue. So I think, in a way, he's halfway between you and me. Longborg agrees with Anna on the science, but not on the solutions. I agree with you and I think also with you that we need to fix climate change, but I think we need to step back and realise over these last 20 years, when everybody's been telling us we need to cut down uh, uh, carbon emissions, We've done virtually no such thing. We're not going to cut carbon emissions for a very simple reason, because we like everything fossil fuels does for us. You know, it's not like we burn fossil fuels to annoy Al Gore. We burn it because it powers everything we like about civilization. So we're not going to get people to stop using energy. What we can do is to make sure that the energy that we're going to be using in 20 or 40 years is green. Don't try to cut carbon emissions. Even if you do it effectively, it's going to cost a lot and it's probably not going to happen, and even if it does, it won't do very much. But if you spend money on research and development into green energy, essentially make sure it becomes cheaper than fossil fuels over the next 20 to 40 years, we've solved global warming. Do you think that we can start, as a global community, having that conversation while we still have people debating the science? 
I think if, if you'll allow me to broaden it a little, because I don't think it's just, I don't know, um, we're just yeah. making you into <laughs> no, it's uh, not punching just ball. But, it, but it's not just the, the Knicks of the world saying maybe it's not happening. It's also the Al Gores of the world who are saying everything bad that's happening is due to global warming. And I think in some way, both of those conversations take away from the central issue, which I think should be about the policies. Policy is not about agreeing about all the, the facts of the world. Policy is about agreeing on what are smart solutions. And that's why I'd like to see us spend money smarter. On realizing right now we're not fixing climate change. Longbog's solution is for us to spend $100 billion a year on research into new energy technologies. That's much cheaper and that's much more effective. Surely a plan that Anna would support. Anna, I think, warmed very much to Bjorn. I think she was really keen to hear what Bjorn had to say and I think opened her mind up to you know, sometimes the futility of pursuing this Katsio to at all costs course of action. Well, I, ho I hope that's the case. What Bjorn Lomborg is saying is incredibly risky. It might work. We might be able to invest heaps of money in renewable energy research and development and come up with a technology that will be so amazing we can switch almost overnight our energy systems. But mainstream economists disagree and say, We've got to certainly do what he says and invest in research and development, but not do that at the expense of cutting emissions now. Anna believes we won't have the incentives to find new energy solutions unless there is a price on carbon, while Nick thinks the market should be free to decide. Their time in New York has certainly brought them closer together, but the journey's not over yet. Across the pond in the UK, the British public are just as divided as we are on the causes of climate change. It hasn't stopped them from moving forward. At Westminster, Anna has a surprise for Nick, a conservative politician who argues for radical change. Tory MP, Zach Goldsmith. The reason we have a political consensus here between the left, the right, and the centre is not because everyone is terrified of climate change. Sure. Everyone is even convinced by the science. There are a lot of people in Parliament who simply don't believe climate change is happening at all. The reason why we don't have big opposition is because people can see that we are at the cusp now of a massive industrial revolution. I know you've talked about the climate change as being an excuse to de-industrialize society. We see it as an opportunity to re-industrialize society, but in a different way. We'll have a different type of economy, a low-carbon economy. But can I just ask, what is the energy mix in the UK right now? What, what proportion of your mix? power is supplied by coal-fired electricity at the oh, moment? It's a lot less than Australia. It's a lot less.